Kia ora kato katoa. I'm Fiona Stevenson for the Sustainable Business Network, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to the launch of the Insights into Sustainability Professionals webinar. I'm not Rod Orham, as you might have noticed, he's unable to join us today, so I'm filling in. And we're very pleased to have you to join us. This is a piece of research in its second year now, and we're really excited about the findings. It started from Sarah Holden of Oxygen Consulting, and it's been a great collaboration between Oxygen, Sustainable Business Council, Sustainable Business Network, and AUT University. And it's great between us to pull our knowledge and see what's happening within the sustainability profession. It's a relatively new profession in terms of uh, longevity, but we're seeing um, some really interesting trends in the growth in the profession. And that's what we're gonna find out about more today. So the way we'll run this, Sarah Holden, the Director of Oxygen, will talk in a minute and present some of the main findings from the report. We'll then hear from three of the other partners with their main takeaway, and then we'll open up to a panel of speakers from across the sustainability profession. And you'll have the chance to ask any questions and find out their thoughts. So do fire them through. There's a Q&A function on your screen. So if you have any thoughts as we go through, just send them through and we can answer them later. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Sarah. So Sarah Holden is the Director of Oxygen Consulting, and she's the brains behind this. This is her baby. She came up with this idea over a year ago, and um, it's grown from there. And Sarah, really interesting findings. I'm looking forward to hearing all about them. Over to you. Thank you, Fiona. Kia ora koutou, and thank you to our um, panellists today as well, uh, Claire, Amy, Alec, and Holly, who will be joining us. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your take on this research later in the session. All right, now let's get this presentation up. Just a little bit of movement there. Here we go. Okay, um, I'd like to start with a few acknowledgements if I could, um, to our awesome partners, Sustainable Business Network, Sustainable Business Council, and Auckland University of Technology, Thank you for your collaboration on this project. Like last year, you've all helped to enrich this research, ensuring it is ethical and robust, and that it digs into the issues that matter to supporting our sustainability professionals. So thank you for the value you bring to this research and for organizing and hosting this launch event. I'm really proud of what we've collectively achieved. A special acknowledgement as well to Magnus Williams and my team who have seen this project from start to finish a process that started in November last year, working through ethics approvals, survey set up, number crunching and analysis to bring out the final report this week. Thank you so much, Magnus, for the massive work you have done to ensure this research took place again. And finally, it wouldn't be possible to have this research without the participation of our sustainability professionals. So thank you for the time you set aside to provide your considered responses. We hope that this research will further support and grow your profession. A few reflections before I present the 2021 results. When we did this research for the first time last year, pre-COVID, it shed light on the sustainability profession. It provided a foundation of knowledge to organisations looking to specify and support these roles and to students looking to get into these roles and to existing sustainability professionals seeking to understand the pathways for career progression. We've had more than 300 downloads of our 2020 report from the Oxygen Consulting website alone, and I'm aware it has been shared further, as was intended, as an open source report. It has been used by businesses and organizations, recruiters, learning institutes, consultancies, students, people looking to transition into sustainability out of their current role, and of course, by our sustainability professionals themselves. It has received interest both here and abroad. I've had so much positive feedback about the first report, and it's encouraging to know that it is helping so many groups in a variety of ways. Like last year, the purpose of our 2021 research is to grow the sustainability profession and I'm absolutely thrilled that this year's results support the idea that it may be fulfilling this purpose. What we have seen in 2021 is that despite the impact of COVID, our sustainability profession has continued to grow. With the global pandemic having a huge impact on jobs within many industries in the past year, we're aware that the sustainability profession has not been immune. 
Anecdotally, we've heard about sustainability job redundancies and of some organisations suspending their sustainability agendas immediately after the level four lockdown last year. Now, while this research does not pick up those who lost their job in 2020, we are aware that many of these people have since gone on to take up sustainability roles in other organisations or even set up their own business in sustainability, giving them the opportunity to participate in this research in their new role. While the past year has certainly been hard for many, we also recognise the coming years may continue to challenge businesses as they navigate an uncertain economic future alongside increasing environmental and social issues. This is why it is encouraging that our 2021 research indicates that despite significant workplace disruption caused by COVID, New Zealand organisations are not taking their foot off the sustainability accelerator and are in fact improving the ways in which they support sustainability professionals in their roles. I will now take you through the five key insights that support these findings. Our first is that organisations have strengthened their investment in sustainability through COVID-19. They have actually increased the number of sustainability roles in their organisations. Bearing in mind we couldn't survey people not employed, 85% of organisations surveyed had no sustainability role disestablishments. And in fact, 12% of organisations actually increased sustainability roles to three to four full-time equivalents. We can also confirm that remuneration levels are comparable with last year, and with the exception of the manager role, all other roles either held fast or increased the average salary in 2021. So this is welcome news as it shows businesses still value these roles and there continues to be a stepwise financial progression through the profession. While we saw a few more businesses decreasing their sustainability budgets in the past year, resourcing remains fairly solid. 33% of organisations held steady on their sustainability budgets, neither increasing nor decreasing them. But 54% of organisations increased their sustainability resourcing in 2021. And sustainability jobs are considered strong. On a scale of non-existent to plentiful, ranging from one to five, 69% of people rate job opportunities four or five out of five. And these jobs may mostly be found in agriculture, utilities and construction. Our second insight is that almost all industry sectors in New Zealand are employing sustainability professionals. So it's not just limited to certain organisations or localities, it's truly becoming woven into the fabric of New Zealand organisations across the board. We can see that sustainability professionals are everywhere. Distribution across different industry sectors is fantastic. You can see this from a glance at the first pie. And interestingly, where utilities, agriculture and construction were identified as the key areas where sustainability jobs are growing, currently the representation of professionals in these sectors sits at about 12% and 4% respectively. So it's great to see these sectors may be expanding their focus on sustainability, potentially driven by looming environmental regulation that might affect these sectors. We're seeing good representation across different organisational types and across different geographic regions. Roles are filtering into all parts of the organisation now. While 23% of organisations have dedicated sustain, a dedicated sustainability division, there are 17 other business units where people's roles are located. This suggests organisations may be embedding sustainability more into business function, placing roles in the areas where they need to drive action. Most of our sustainability professionals are in dedicated full-time roles. This year we see 81% of people in full-time full roles, which is comparable with our 2020 result of 82% full-time. 79% are in roles with a dedicated focus on sustainability, which is up from 66% in 2020. So both of these results reinforce the idea that businesses are still maintaining a strong focus on sustainability. 
Our third insight is that sustainability drives organizational purpose and addressing climate change is the top priority now and in the future. When we looked at the motivations for organizational sustainability, 63% agreed that their business was doing it for public good values based reasons. 60% said it drives their organizational purpose and social impact. It was interesting to see these drivers rising above cost savings and efficiency, which were the traditional drivers a couple of decades ago. This illustrates how sustainability has shifted from being about saving a few pennies to now being core to an organizational uh, social license to operate. It is just such smart business to be a sustainable business. Organisations recognise that they need to do more to address social and environmental issues. In fact, people felt that their organisations need to nearly double their efforts to do enough to address these challenges. Like last year, climate change and addressing environmental challenges, our green agenda, are the top ranked sustainability priorities for businesses now and in future. Increase, interestingly, we added in financial recovery, but as you can see, people rated this as the lowest future sustainability priority, which does give us some confidence that people see this as not going to be a long-term challenge for businesses in the same way that climate change is. Our fourth insight, and one that I'm really happy to see, is that sustainability professionals feel more empowered, are experiencing better work-life balance and greater job satisfaction. So a shout out to organisations here, sustainability professionals are feeling more supported in their roles. If we look at role empowerment, it has taken a great leap this year. Those feeling highly empowered in their roles is up from 52% last year to nearly 80% of people this year. People are feeling much more supported in their roles too, with a good drop on last year, where 18% did not feel very supported to only 6% in this category this year. This is balanced with increases in people feeling reasonably and highly supported, which is excellent. We saw a similar trend with team connection. So all of this shows that organizations are making more effort to support their people and connect them within the business. We've noticed this year that work demands for sustainability professionals have decreased, which is great. Although I'd note that these are now just in line with all other New Zealand professionals, but it is good to see that this is the case as I think it shows a maturing in the sustainability profession. Interestingly, job stress dropped down across all professions, although it's worth noting that sustainability professionals are still experiencing more stress than other professions. Despite this, sustainability professionals are at lower risk of job burnout, which is measured by lower levels of emotional exhaustion and cynicism than other New Zealand professionals. And we suspect that this may be because sustainability professionals are experiencing greater work-life balance and job satisfaction than other New Zealand professionals. Our final insight and one of the really interesting findings was the extent to which soft skills are crucial to the role of the sustainability professional as a change agent. If we look at what capabilities are needed now, these are the green bars, we can see that the top four are communication skills, building partnerships, problem solving, and strategic skills. And if we look at what is needed in future, these are the blue bars, these are also softer skills. The biggest growth areas are in cultural competency, people management, and leadership skills, and our existing capabilities, strategic skills, building partnerships, and problem solving are all still going to be relevant and needing further development in future. So this speaks to the role of the sustainability professional as a change agent in the organization and the importance of these softer skills in driving role competency. So as it might be expected, we're seeing these softer skills balanced out by an increasing use of external consultants for technical work, such as carbon accounting, assurance and auditing, and technical advisory, 
And I can say we are certainly seeing that being the case in our cl own client experiences at Oxygen. I'd like to close by saying these in insights are truly heartening and provide a sense of optimism for the future. We can see that the sustainability profession is strengthening and that organizations are continuing to drive genuine sustainability action despite the potential economic challenges presented in the COVID-19 recovery. Our sustainability professional strength is in their softer skills, leadership, communication, problem solving, relationship building and influencing, key skills to being an effective organizational change agent in an adaptable world. In a critical year when New Zealand is turning climate legislation into action, sustainability professionals and their organizations are stepping up. Namihi nui, kia koe, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Fascinating findings from the report and thank you for sharing them with us. Before we move on to the other speakers, I wonder whether I could ask you, were you surprised by the findings this year? Because it's, I mean, in, given it's been such a turbulent year, the findings were remarkably positive and encouraging across the sustainability profession, whether you're looking at the numbers or the, the people skills and the work-life balance. It's, I mean, across the board, the findings are remarkably positive, which I think is fantastic. Did that surprise you? It did actually, and I must admit, we did go in with some predetermined um, ideas that it might be a little bit doom and gloom, but um, in fact, I guess what it suggests is that sustainability has really become um, part and parcel of core business now. It's not one of those sort of things that is considered a nice to have, as someone quoted um, during the research, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really part and parcel of, of the way of a way of operating now. So um, it's, it's something that is really positive to see. And I think the research should uh, give organisations a lot of confidence in continuing to progress with their sustainability agendas. Fantastic, thank you. Well, next we're gonna hear from three of the other partners to get their main takeaway. So I'd like to invite on the screen, Rachel Brown, who's the CEO of the Sustainable Business Network, Mike Burrell, who's the Executive Director of the Sustainable Business Council, and Mario Lips-Viesma, who is the Head of um, Ethics and Sustainability Leadership at AUT. Do we have all three on the screen? Thank you. Now, I just like to know from each of you, can you share with the audience your one main takeaway? If you were to say one thing that stood out for you, what would it be? Mike, can I start with you? What's your main takeaway? Thanks, Fiona. Um, well, actually, I think uh, Sarah's just eaten my lunch. I would have agreed entirely with her takeaway, which is that uh, we've moved from um, sustainability seeing as an add-on to it being at the heart of business. And I suppose the surprise to me in this report is that during one of the hardest years that businesses have faced in, you know, in many, many decades, that sustainability as a profession continued to grow. And I suppose what that speaks to is one of the slides that uh, Sarah presented earlier on, I think it was their, their third one, which is that um, sustainability is beginning to drive purpose within businesses. It's becoming core to business. It's at the core of their strategy as well. And so that's very hopeful to me because I think what it means is that unlike 2007 when we saw a massive fall away of a focus on sustainability during hard times, we're not seeing that this time. So to me, it's, it's a very different situation from where it was, say, 13, 14 years ago. This is a very encouraging report. Thank you. Thank you. Mario, how about you? You're seeing things from a different perspective with students coming in to learn sustainability at AUT. What's your main takeaway? My main takeaway is that uh, it's time for the profession itself in New Zealand to really organize themselves and have forums like this to get together and say, how is the profession actually developing in New Zealand? Because uh, you see with this profession that at first, you know, it just establishes legitimacy, like any profession, like HR or IT. And there's a lot of uncertainty. What are these people actually doing? But there's also a lot of enthusiasm. And then in the second stage, you see that a profession starts to refine itself and organizations and the people in the profession actually understand what they're actually doing and they get the empowerment and the work satisfaction as we also saw from our data that goes with that. And 
and then you see that the groups are moving in the in the third stage, which is the establishment stage. You get junior people, you get people at CFO high levels, and the junior people are really happy because hey, it's a great profession to be in. The people in high levels are really happy because they're you know they've really moved from being to the court from the from being from the periphery to the core of the organization. This is now important, as Mike also said, and Sarah, it's the people in the middle that at that point, and we can see that in our data, are starting to wander around, uh, who should I actually have access to? Uh, where is my position best placed? Uh, how about my career progression. And so it's important to collectively, professionally look at that group. It's really important because we saw from HR and IT professions, if that's not well addressed, those people you start seeing most turnover. If it is well addressed, you really get a lot out of those people. So it's an important time for the profession and organizations to look at the profession, for the profession to look at itself and be really well supported. Wonderful, thank you. I like the way you talked about lots of happy people. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Happy people at all different levels. Fantastic. Rachel, what's your one takeaway from the report? Uh, kia ora, Tato. Um, thanks, Fiona. Uh, again, I just want to acknowledge uh, Sarah and Magnus. Wonderful work, really great report, and I really hope you all enjoy reading it. Uh, my biggest thing, there's, there's a couple of bits that have come out. One was around the context. So Mike was talking about the context that we're in, what happened in 2008 and going forward. What was really different for me this time was that we had the right conversations going on in Aotearoa. We had a government that was really committed to keeping climate, waste, biodiversity loss, inequality at the top of their agenda. But we also had a media that was doing that too. So the, we didn't lose those conversations through COVID, which was a really positive thing. And then when you think about the skills pieces that Sarah was pointing out in her presentation, the skills piece where people were saying, we know we need all these, these transformation skills to come through in our own um, profession, that was really good to see. But they also recognised they needed to double their effort. And if we think about this in context of COVID, there's a couple of strategies that most of the globe is now working on. We either race back to the way things were and use this as a, a blip in time as we race back to the old model, which frankly was broken, or we use this opportunity as a reframing so that we do a much fairer, more regenerative for nature and more regenerative for communities so that we've got an intergenerational flow that starts to come out of this. So I think in terms of the skill set, I really want to encourage the professions to start thinking about that much bigger picture um, and the future that we're all going to bring because minute changes is not going to be what we, what we need right now. So it's kind of a challenge, a congratulations uh, and a big chunk of hope going in there for, for a better way forward, Fiona. That's how I'm, that's how I'm reading it. Great, let's hope so. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all the partners. I'd now like to invite our panel of speakers onto the screen. Now we've got a panel of people from across the sustainability profession to give you their views on the findings from the report. So I'd like to introduce Claire Walker. So Claire Walker is Head of Sustainability at Sky City and Alec Tang is Head of Sustainability at Auckland Council. So they've been in this profession for a long time, um, lots of wisdom between them and working for large organizations. So they will have seen a lot. We also have Holly Leach from the Sustainable Business Network. Holly is uh, an up and coming sustainability professional. So she graduated from Otago University just a few years ago and did a master's in sustainable business. And so she started out and in her time, things have changed. She's also led the Now Crowd, which is the group of young professionals in sustainability. And we have Amy T from Amy T Recruiting. And she can give us a perspective from a recruiter's point of view. What is she seeing in terms of the company's recruiting? the positions they want, the skills they want, and what um, skills people can match them with. Do fire your questions through. They're starting to come in. Um, so send them through and put it to our panel. But I wonder I could kick off first of all and just ask generally, um, Claire, what are you seeing within the sustainability profession generally? Thanks, Fiona. Um, 
Look, I think what we have seen throughout COVID, which has been really interesting, is almost the um, cementing of the importance of social license as an integral part of uh, a wide range of industries and organizations. And I think it was almost a a time where the value proposition was really tested when we looked at the um, media um, coverage of organizations who were having to make really significant um, and, and often detrimental changes in terms of their organization. Um, in terms of, I think anyone who, who really had not invested in social license um, was tending to be beaten up fairly badly um, in the media. And I think it's, you know, with the massive disruption and change that all organizations saw to a greater or lesser extent and my organization at Sky City was certainly kind of at the epicenter if you like of of um, the impacts of COVID and I think you know what we saw and so I'm not surprised to see this come through in the report is that just the value and the absolute criticality of sustainability to the purpose of an organization and the social license to operate was was absolutely cemented and those who had invested came through that really difficult public time far better um, which is really encouraging to see. Thank you. Alec, what about you? Are you seeing similar things? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to reflect on two things that people have talked about. One is the nature of the work that we're doing as sustainability professionals, which Sarah noted, you know, moving very much into that sustainability strategy and plan development. So really strategic. And then the second bit is about the skills that people see as required for sustainability professionals, the softer skills, the communication skills, and, and how we bring people together. And those two, for what I've seen over the last year, particularly over lockdown, is there's a lot of sustainability professionals thinking, well, how do I develop? How do I grow? How do I build those skills? And so training courses like the Sustainable Business Network and the Sustainable Business Council have been really interesting arenas for people to look into. And then the other side is the acknowledgement of the skills people have. So we've seen groups like the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment growing their membership base here where you actually get active um, acknowledgement. So becoming certified or chartered environmentalists. I myself last year became a fellow of the Institute and trying to build your own competencies as you grow into those more senior, as we've heard, roles with, with a broader remit and a very strategic function around it. Thank you. Holly, what are you seeing amongst your own age group and your peers? I mean, what can you take away from these findings for sustainability professionals that you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I've been in sustainability, like you said, Fiona, for about only sort of three years. And I think we have every year I get more and more young people approach me saying, I'm really passionate about this stuff. I want to do it. I want to be involved. Like, do I get um, qualified? Do I do training? Like, how, how do I get into this industry? Which is super duper exciting. And I think um, what was interesting that came out of the report is that, you know, you don't necessarily need to be qualified into this. Um, it's, you know, the skills that you learn, like on, on the, um, you know, within a role and the people you meet and the mentorship that you have is critical. Um, so, yeah, I would sort of say that you know, and it was also um, obvious in the report that sustainability professionals come from across the board, you know, it's all industries, all um, departments within an organization. So really building on your current um, role and then sort of digging deeper in where you can be um, making a difference in terms of sustainability within your organization um, and then going down that track. Thank you, Amy. What are you saying from a recruitment point of view? I mean, Holly mentioned some of the skills there and the background necessary or, you know, how much training you need. When you see companies recruiting, have you seen a change in what they're looking for? Or what would you say are the core skills or training that would be helpful for people who want to get into the space? So what I see a lot of, Fiona, is organisations who want to... Uh, you know, move the needle in terms of their sustainability practice. So they're often looking for people that are quite proven. If they're, if they're recruiting externally and bringing someone into the organisation, then they often want someone that can really add value, both the technical hard skills, but also absolutely the soft skills. And without that ability to influence and have credibility, both with the executive and the board, uh, it'll be very hard for people to get taken on. Um, in terms of the more junior uh, graduate workforce, uh, we are seeing a lot of interest in that and often bringing people through an organization's graduate program 
or in other parts of the organization so that sustainability professionals can learn the business more generally, develop their skills, and then be able to move into sustainability as a specialization. Uh, and also a lot of uh, people in organizations uh, who are actively trying to break down the doors of their sustainability units and, and get on board. So it's a very in-demand area. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of candidates who are you know, wanting, if they are open to move uh, to another organization, then they're actively asking about the mentoring and the development and the opportunities. So they'll be much more attracted to go to work for an organization where they know the leader is uh, interested is you know involved in SBN and SBC and the Climate Leaders Coalition. All of those things are seen as really positive signs by candidates if they're looking at an organisation. Thank you very much, Amy. Now the questions are starting to come in. I've had one here that I think you might be best responding to. The question is: Are you seeing mid-career professionals changing career direction into sustainability, and how would one go about this? <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of people who would really like to do that. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that that's something that people are keen to do. When, when I've seen people be able to do that successfully, it's usually moving in their current organisation. So they're at an organisation with a well-developed sustainability function and expertise, and then they can get involved by secondment or in a project um, to develop that skills and experience. And, and then grow in that area and grow into that. It is harder in any functional expertise to make a move to a new organization and to a new area in that mid-career point because you know, you'd really have to go back and start from scratch. If you're in your current organization where you've got some reputational capital, uh, that move will be a lot easier. Can I just jump in there, Fiona? Sorry. Uh, uh, Amy makes a really good point, and it links to something that someone else has asked a question about in terms of, you know, for, for me, sitting in my role, that collaboration piece across the organization is critical. And so I actually feel like it's inherent in people in my position, other kind of mid-senior managers in a sustainability function to pull people in. And to make sure, you know, that I have a particular topic here, I may not sit in my team, but I need a, a, a expertise from finance or expertise from HR. And I actually think that's part of the profession. Mario was talking about it, how, how we grow this profession. And, and actually, I'd say it's not just about people jumping in. It's us pulling people into this, into, this, into this discipline because it cannot just sit as this sustainability function. It needs to be a way of thinking for the whole organization as we go forward. Thank you. And actually, that's a, that links in neatly to one of the questions that's come through, is what's the panellists' take on having a dedicated sustainability team as opposed to embedding sustainability practitioners within all business units? Claire, are, are you of like mind with, with Alec about that? Uh, yes, look, absolutely. What we have seen... Um, certainly it's in, the, in my experience at Sky City, is um, having a very much a distributed model for uh, accountability for sustainability has enabled us to achieve fantastic levels of buy-in um, from many different levels down through the organisation. Um, I'm feeling sitting here feeling somewhat vindicated, actually, uh, as an HR professional who um, I'm now into my second executive role where I've been accountable for sustainability in an organisation. And that was a, quite a rare thing um, seven years ago, uh, but absolutely, when I look at the skill set that's involved and I think about what we're trying to achieve, it really comes down to behavior change. And um, I, I really like the insight um, in the report around sustainability professionals as change agents. So yes, our sustainability professionals are change agents and there's a whole new suite of skills that we're seeing develop around that, um, which aligns beautifully with people. Uh, but they also, I think, have their greatest impact when they are working through uh, people within an organization who have accountability for aspects of the business as, a, as their day job. So 
how that translates in, in Sky City is um, for our um, sustainability framework has five pillars. We have a pillar lead for each of those areas. And, and those pillar leads are people who have a day job within our organization. It might be our CFO, it might be our chief operating officer. So our sustainability um, professional is very much around the strategic input and the direction, the delivery and the implementation is very much um, people who are absolutely bedded into our organization in a really tangible sense, um, which is how we've been able to, to get the greatest um, progress. It, it is also challenging. You know, we find um, there's a temptation to own it and just deliver it and get on and as, a, as, a, as a standalone sustainability professional. It takes longer. It's, you have to work harder to, to take people with you and um, sell the, the, you know, the, the, the proposition of a sustainable um, sustainability program but ultimately you get far greater buy-in and um, that's that's something that's worked extremely well and I think it's absolutely the way to go yeah thank you Claire now mm. we're getting a few questions about research itself so I might invite Sarah back in a minute to join us but one of the questions I can answer it was um one of our uh, viewers asked if there's um, any comparison with previous years, what other existing research is there. Now, um, Sarah started this a year ago, so there is a comparison with last year, and, and much of that came through in Sarah's findings, and the report from last year will be on Oxygen Consultants website. Um, is there any other research from previous decades, is the question. So I, I'm not aware of anything. Have you come across anything, Sarah? Uh, no, not here in New Zealand. I mean, Mario may have um, more insight around uh, global research that's comparable, but to my knowledge, there has been no research like this in New Zealand beyond, you know, what we started last year. So um, hopefully we can work up decades to come. Um, so we have some really good um, comparisons that we can draw upon in future years. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of questions about COVID and how that affected. One of them is... Um, saying it's very positive results, but one factor is that those who are not currently employed were not surveyed, um, which, which is an issue which is hard to get around. And the factor about the better work-life balance, could that have been due to more people working from home? So how were COVID factors incorporated or accounted for in the results? Well, I guess in a couple of ways, really. So just um, on the work-life balance piece, we did actually compare um, the New Zealand sustainability professionals against um, all other New Zealand professions and work-life balance still stacked up higher for uh, sustainability professionals. And bear in mind, you know, broadly across uh, New Zealand workplaces, the um, working from home um, practices, I think that was in the question, um, have been, you know, broadly adopted, not just by sustainability professionals. So, you know, I think there's still some merit in, um, see, you know, seeing that result for what it is and that new, uh, sustainability professionals are indeed uh, experiencing greater work-life balance. Um, in terms of how uh, COVID was um, factored into the survey, we did ask a few specific questions, um, asking things like, was financial recovery, um, you know, going to be an important uh, topic to focus on in terms of, um, you know, future sustainability topics. But generally it was, uh, you know, COVID, I think, provided the backdrop to answering all of the questions this year. And we, um, we were trying to compare responses of those questions against responses last year um, to, to um, I guess, obtain what the, the impact of COVID might have been on different responses. Thanks, Sarah. Now, I've got a question for the floor here. The comment is, in the role competencies, it was unsurprising to see the softer, less technical skills to the floor. Um, but interestingly, there wasn't a specific collaboration competency, yet multi-organisational projects will be of increasing relevance. Do the panellists have a view on this? Just wonder if anyone would like to respond to that, with your opinion on the importance of multi-organisation projects and collaboration. Uh I can comment on that. I noticed that as well. And I was super impressed and was like, woohoo, we're seeing um, a strong need for building relationships and collaboration. Um, and I think we're um, seeing that as well. Uh, you know, at SBN, you know, a lot of organizations coming together and wanting to solve these problems um, collaboratively, which is really promising. You know, I think uh, most sustainability professionals will think that we're not, you know, getting to the scale and pace that we need. Um, so I think, yeah, solving the problems together, we've got more of a chance of getting there. So 
I was stoked when I saw that um, result. Great. Any comments from anyone else on that one? I'd just add um, that I think across the board, we're seeing a focus on collaboration and the idea that that multi-organisation uh, approach is the way to get system change. Uh, and we're not going to get it as individual organisations. One of the current initiatives of the government is creating workforce development councils, which are uh, you know, across sectors and they will bring together the work of ITOs under sort of big sector clusters and sustain it we're putting boards together at the moment for those entities and one of the really key themes is to have sustainability embedded into all of the workforce development and industry vocational training initiatives so it feels to me like there's messages there around the importance of sustainability but done in a way that's about system and sector collaboration so absolutely we're going to see a lot more of that happening Thank if you. I can just jump in, I, I, and on that point about collaboration, I think one of the one of the findings that Sarah you shared, which is really great, which links to this, is that question of connectedness. And I think it's great to see that sustainability professionals are seeing that they are more connected to their organisation, which is the way I read it. And and I think that points to the collaboration piece. You know, five years ago, maybe not even five years ago, it was maybe one sustainability manager in an organisation being tasked with driving the whole thing. And actually now we're seeing that the, the, the recognition, Claire, you talked about needing to pull people in, needing to collaborate more is really important. Just to reflect on one of the other questions where it said, you know, is it one or is it many? I think the, the nature of your role is evolving and, and, and um, there's a collaborative need, but there's also a need to make sure we are heading in the right direction. And so it's kind of an interesting tension where you want to bring people together. There's a huge amount of enthusiasm to do some cool stuff. But there also needs to be someone going, is that the right thing we should be doing from a sustainability perspective? Are we actually addressing the most material issue or are we just doing anything? And I think that's the role that I see a, a, a person who may be the sustainability officer or may be the sustainability manager having to build that ability to bring people together, but also be quite forceful to say, no, that's not what we should be doing or this is actually the way that we should be focused. Mm. I was just reflecting too that um, an area I, I think the sustainability profession will start to, um, to grapple with is, is operating within an agile environment and many organisations are, are moving to, to an age, agile um, uh, way of working and that lends itself beautifully to um, collaboration but also to um, experimentation and um, being able to take an iterative approach to developing um, strategies and, and programs which is interesting when you think about the sort of time frame for many sustainable uh, sustainability initiatives they tend to be very long time frames so I think it's something that as a sector as an industry a group of professionals that um, we probably need to start turning our minds to is how does the sustainability profession operate in an agile environment? Thank you. The question here about the not-for-profit and charity sector, um, pointing out that only 11% of the responses were from this sector and yet they're implicit in much of the work being done. Sarah, I know that the research went out as wide as possible, encouraging anyone working in sustainability to respond, didn't it? Um, I don't know whether 11% is indicative of the profession as a whole. Um, yeah, did well, you have any thoughts on that? That's the challenge with, um, you know, young research like, uh, um, you know, like ours is that we're still trying to get a really good understanding of the demographics of sustainability professionals. Sorry about the lighting. Um, and, and in fact, you know, I, I think that's a core part of, of doing this research year on year is to start to establish, um, you know, in which uh, sectors we're seeing it uh, repeatedly. And, and that's something that we'll learn more and more over time, but also as more and more par people participate in the, in the research. Thank you. Question here, is there much current knowledge with it of organisations within the mental health sector that focus on sustainability? Don't know if anyone can answer that, whether there's much knowledge there. Perhaps not. Mm. Perhaps that's our answer if no one knows. <laughs> We're not sure. <laughs> that's okay. Um, 
Now, a question here. Someone's getting lots of questions from students across many disciplines and degrees about getting into a sustainability career. And there's lots of examples of career fairs and recruitment events for other professions. This person is putting one together in September for sustainability. Are there any thoughts from the panelists on what that should look like? Um, we need to keep the great talent coming in and we're to address the challenges we face. So there's a question for you all. For a careers fair on sustainability, what should it look like? Might bring Mario back into this one if you're still there, Mario, because um, you have a lot of contact with students and you might have some insights here about uh, what would be most useful for, for what they want. Any thoughts from you on that? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, yes, yes. What, what we know from young people in terms of what attracts them to the sustainability profession, so that is then what you would want to speak to, um, is uh, first of all that they have that this is the first generation coming out of high school already with a lot of sustainability knowledge, and so the the biggest interest is how do I make a difference? How do I apply this? How do I not keep standing on the sideline when I'm actually worried about what is happening? Happening in the world. So I think that is a really important thing to, to translate whatever you're going to do it into action, into what they can actually do. I think it's really important. The second part uh, for young people is that they are a more individualistic generation, but that they are realizing that they can only make a difference when they get connected up to bigger networks. And so that systemic thing that people already talked about, if every young person in their own household thinks about what difference can I make, they're actually starting to feel hopeless and disempowered. Whereas if they are connected to networks um, and you can facilitate that somehow, then I think you can really onboard them really, really fast in very positive ways. The third thing is that with I don't know if I can say this, but I think I should, that maybe their expectations are sometimes a little bit too high. So it is also about saying, well, this is what a junior role would look like in these type of organizations. You're not immediately going to have strategic impact. And these are the skills you need to learn to become like an Alec or a Claire or, a, you know, uh, or an, this, this is kind of what the trajectory will look like, I think. If, if I just jump in, Mario, and, and I've been lucky, so I've been working with Mario and lecturing to a whole bunch of great students, and, and, and I just uh, re um, reaffirm that. There's a, there's a question like, what, what does a sustainability professional do? And I think if you had that, um, that careers fair where you had people going, well, actually, this is what sustainability looks like for me, but actually what someone else looks like, it's over here, and, and these are the different things that different people are doing, because it's not necessarily constrained to you're just doing X, Y, and Z. And I always talk about you know, as a profession, it is about change. It is about effecting change in whatever context that you happen to be working in. And the last bit that Mario raises, which is great, and Holly can probably talk to this late, that connectivity of students nowadays is amazing. The amount of clubs, the amount of things that they're getting on with, aside from just studying. And I remember when I studied, it was like, go to lecture, go home. May have gone to the pub on the way. But, you know, but there's a whole range of other activities that's going on. So that knowledge of connection and the importance of connection to drive this change is so already really mature uh, within students coming through university. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you, Holly. Anything to add? Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I think you know we all the, with the student strike for cli climate going on, um, we know that these young people are terrified of um, what their future looks like and the impacts of climate change. So, absolutely, Alec, that importance important of um, connectiveness and networks and, you know, being surrounded by other like-minded people um, and feeling empowered, um, you know, that we are going to get there and that there is hope, I think is really, really important. And I think um, also what we're seeing is, you know, this, I've seen it in the past couple of years is the huge focus on climate change. So I think there is also probably a, um, a need for people going through uni to look at sort of climate science and cl um, climate reporting and accounting and all that stuff. I think that that's probably a growing um, profession um, that's coming through. But yeah, I mean, sustainability is across the board. So I think for your climate, uh, your career fair, it's important to get, you know, representatives from everyone there speaking about their experience. 
Can I very quickly say something about also the diversity that we might see, and I'm stereotyping here, I am aware of this, but that you might get, say, a typical Western female student coming through being interested in one particular area like climate change, and you might get, say, a... Uh, Pacific Island student coming through might be more interested in some social aspect of sustainability. Uh, you might get an Indian student coming through that is more interested, um, you know, about an international aspect of sustainability. So, so that we're also aware that just because we're doing sustainability, diversity doesn't in, um, disappear out of the window and that it's really important to integrate these things. That's very well said, um, Mario. And I was just thinking uh, also about, given the New Zealand context, that it would be fantastic to have an iwi, um, a te ao Māori um, perspective as part of a careers fair in terms of, you know, inclusivity and I think some really, really, really interesting perspectives. And I was just delighted to see um, iwi engagement coming up the priority list in terms of organisations focusing on sustainability. It's certainly something that we, uh, you know, have been in the last few years in my career far more focused on, just in terms of the New Zealand bicultural um, context. So a career fair for professionals to see that that's a really important perspective to learn and understand early on in your career would, would be fantastic. No, sorry, you... sorry, Fiona, I just want to jump in there because that's a really important, Claire, comment about Te Ao Māori and how critical that is from a sustainability perspective. Rachel talks about it earlier, about regenerative and regenerative principles, and that is underpinning, or that is Te Ao Māori in its, in its essence. And that was one of the important things that we learned through Te Tariki Tafari Auckland's climate plan was, was working closely with Mana Whenua to say, well, what does that mean? And if you look at the plan, we, Mana Whenua didn't talk about sustainability, they talked about Tioro Tamaki Makoro, the well-being of Tamaki, and the fact that that was the underpinning factor that drives how sustainable we will be is how sustainable those fuck proper connections actually are between people, place, and the planet. So it's such an important aspect that we need to it's make almost, sure is there. It's almost, uh, you know, as a, as a element of a sustainability professionals, um, you know, coming through the university or, or, or whatever pathway they have, in my view, absolutely essential. And again, Mario, really insightful comments around being mindful as, as to how we develop as a profession, still very immature as a profession. And I think in the New Zealand context, thinking about the elements that make up a, a suite of capability for a sustainability professional, we just need to ensure that in there we've captured um, the, the Māori worldview um, and a view, Māori view of sustainability in the New Zealand context and, and but equally relevant in other obviously other countries to have an indigenous view because um, it's, it's absolutely fundamental. Totally also, it gives permission. Uh, so we, we use a lot of Mataranga Māori in our classes, even won awards, international awards for doing that. But one, it, it's not just to address the bicultural injustices that we need to address, but it gives all the students of all the other cultures permission to bring worldviews into this. And so it, it is really, I would think also in organizations and corporations, really important. It opens up um, conversations that you wouldn't have had before. Uh, it's, yeah. What about the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN's SDGs? There's a question here about how their importance. Now, I know that was included in the research, and from memory, it didn't rank in the top half of topics. Anyone's thoughts on the importance of the SDGs for sustainability going forward? Just, I also noted and found that really, really interesting. It's been a, a, a really significant focus for a number of years, um, and I was quite fascinated to see that 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 is that is dropped back. Um, I, I wouldn't be in a position to suggest why that might be, um, other than I wonder if it's a if it's a maturing of the profession in New Zealand. We're finding frameworks and models that are that are more relevant to our own context, like the to our Maori worldview. Um, but but others, I'm sure Sarah will absolutely have a view on that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, from our own experiences with clients as well, working with the SDGs, 
many of them, I think, see the, you know, it's great to have uh, global goals and a bigger picture that we're working towards. But in terms of, um, you know, driving action here and now, they're very much focused on, um, you know, the, the guts of their own sustainability strategies and plans and, and actioning those. Um, rather than actioning towards um, a higher purpose, I think they see that as long as they can or if they start by making the connection to it, they are working towards it as a stepping stone rather than it being the, the, you know, the goal um, that is localised for their own business. I think we get a much, a much more localised um, version uh, when, when uh, organisations take these plans um, back into their own uh, offices. Thank you. Now we just have a few minutes left and the, the questions are keeping on coming, which is great. It's a sign of real interest in this. I've just got a couple more I'll pose before we all need to wrap up. Um, one of them is about the importance of the CEO and senior management team in this, um, which is a really valid point. Sarah, was that included in the research, the um, CEO's interest in sustainability? You know, is that something that should be looked at going forward? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're always uh, open to improving the research in future, so welcome any feedback um, and suggestions people have on um, what they would like to see in future reports. We didn't ask that question this year, um, but I do know as well, just don't, from my own personal experience working within organisations um, and with clients as well, now it does make a huge difference if your CEO and leadership team are not really on board with this stuff. It, it, it's very difficult to drive progress. So I would say it's absolutely fundamental um, to have that leadership and that passion at the top. I, I think if I just jump in and, and someone else mentioned it before, I, it's, it's actually not just important. Um, it's critical from a risk perspective. So we saw yesterday Parliament introduce the, um, effectively the TCFD disclosures, the mandatory disclosures. Like if your CEO, if your CFO, if your board is not across this, they are not doing their job properly um, from, a, from a business risk perspective. So it is no longer an optional. Obviously, Sarah, it really helps me as, a, as someone trying to drive change to have the CE to, 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 to give that push from the top down. But almost the push is from us up saying, look, this isn't a nice to have. This is a critical part of your role as a CE. It is a critical part of the director's roles in terms of their governance and oversight. So it is no longer this, you know, should we have that? It is a you need to be across this now going forward. And I think if you think about what CEOs are focused on, they're obviously intently focused, particularly for a publicly listed company, on investors. And um, there's been a quite marked um, increase in the amount of interest and focus from the investment community um, on sustainability on ESG. So I think that certainly um, sharpens the focus of, of CEOs um, on sustainability. That's certainly what I'm seeing. And just one small thing to add, it's, it's not just the emotional support, but what international research is also showing is that a lot that we're getting a group of CEOs, you know, you have the group of CEOs that is not interested, you have the ones that are strongly supportive, but we're getting an important group of CEOs in the middle that, would, that are getting more supportive, but are not well educated on sustainability. They don't understand systems issues, um, you know, all sorts of really important key things for strategic sustainability. So it's a big role for the sustainability officers higher up in the organization to find ways to educate their CEOs in ways that uh, the CEOs don't get uh, upset by having to be educated. Thank you. I'm going to ask one final question and we better wrap up. So this last question is from someone who's seeing a lot of movement amongst the larger corporates doing some good stuff and also an increasing number of smaller companies doing great stuff. But there's a gap in the middle of the market. What can we do as an industry as a whole to bridge that gap? Would anyone like to take that question? I'm going to make it accessible and simple. That sounds like a great note to finish on. <laughs> make it accessible and simple. 
We'll wrap up there. We could keep on going, but I know you've got other things to do. I'd like to extend a really big thank you to all the panelists for giving it that time. Thank you to everyone who completed the research. It's so valuable to see these findings. So um, please complete the research in a year's time because it will be going on then. And it's so important to track these changes over time because ultimately what we want together is for the profession to grow, for people to work in it. So as a nation, Aotearoa can improve in sustainability um, that we can work together. So thank you very much to everyone who's contributed to the research and took part today. Thank you. Kia ora.